If you've ever seen the classic Marvel cartoon, Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes, I'm willing to bet that one of the things you remember best is how well that show handled Thor, the God of Thunder, and just how much fun this character was. For me, Thor's always been one of the most intriguing Marvel characters, and I honestly hold the adaptation we see in Avengers EMH to be perhaps the definitive interpretation of the character, and in this video, I want to talk about why that is. I've made a bunch of videos on what made this show great, and what made its characters work, and with the release of Thor Love and Thunder imminent, I thought it was about time I made a video on Goldilocks himself, because in a show packed with standout characterizations, this guy somehow manages to be a consistent highlight. <laughs> I make a lot of deep dives on this channel. My last video was a 22 minute video essay on the hidden links between the MCU Captain America franchise and real world American exceptionalism. This video isn't going to be anything quite so complex though. Instead, I'm just going to be exploring a couple of reasons I've picked out for why this version of Thor works so well. But before we get started, I just wanna share the reason I'm making this video. Don't worry, this isn't an ad, so just hear me out. You probably clicked on this video because you remember this show, and you remember how good it was. How it blended decades of comic book inspirations together, deftly balancing world building, character and storytelling to produce a vision of the Marvel Universe that was compelling to fans of all ages. Well, if that's the case, you're not alone. There's a whole community of Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes fans still out there, and their goal is to get this show revived, to make that third season happen, to resolve that cliffhanger we were left with all those years ago. This video is two things. It's my latest attempt to promote this cause, the hashtag save the Yoastverse campaign, and it's also my entry in a project I've put together called Earth's Mightiest Playlist. I'll explain both of these more at the end of the video, and you can also find all this information in the description and the pinned comment, but for now, let's get back to Thor. The first point to make about this God of Thunder is that he's the God of Thunder. There's no beating around the bush here with regard to Thor's divinity. Earth's Mightiest Heroes never tries to shy away from the fact that Thor is an ancient godly being from a mythical realm suffused with magic. And that might sound obvious, but it kinda isn't. You have to remember that this show with this version of Thor was developed in the late 2000s. Around the time EMH was being put together, the biggest, most culturally significant new adaptations of the Thor character were probably Ultimate Thor, first seen in 2002, and MCU Thor, who'd show up on the big screen about six months after EMH premiered. Both of these versions, initially at least, tried to walk back the magic and the divinity of the character. At the start of Ultimate Thor's story, there was this whole mystery about whether the hero really was a god, or whether he was an artificially enhanced environmental activist. And the first couple of MCU Thor films went to pains to establish that in this world, the Asgardians weren't gods. Merely long-lived powerful aliens worshipped as such. We are not gods. We're born, we live, we die, just as humans do. In both cases, these reservations were eventually relaxed, with the narratives increasingly willing to treat Thor as a god as time wore on. It's hard to say why precisely such a reluctance existed in the first place. This was the age of the gritty reboot. Perhaps both stories were attempting to ground this fantastical figure with an extra veneer of something approaching realism. After all, it's awfully 60s. It's very Jack Kirby, a realm of mythical gods coming into contact with modern humanity. With feathered helmets and cod Shakespearean dialogue, who would take that seriously in the 21st century? Well, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, did. From his first appearance, the show's never afraid to embrace the full mythical magical angle of this character, campy or cheesy though it may have seemed, in an age of dark nights and civil wars. And this faith in the source material paid off. Some of this character's best moments come as a result of this decision. Moments where voice actor Rick D. Wasserman really hammers home the power, haughtiness and authority of this mythical godly character. I have felt your wrath, Frost Giants. Now you shall feel mine! It's the same with Thor's environments too. Take Asgard for instance. The Rainbow Bridge isn't a crystalline roadway linked to a teleportation chamber. It's a rainbow bridge. 
a rainbow that you walk across, straight out of a fairy tale. Or, you know, the Eddas. One of the highlights of the entire show is the sequence of episodes where the Avengers save Asgard, and these normally Earth-bound figures are thrust headfirst into this world of gods and monsters. This decision, then, to go all-in on the hyper-stylized divinity of classic Thor facilitates not only cool moments, but also cool stories. This is what happens when you're not embarrassed by the sheer comic bookiness of a character like Marvel's take on Thor, but instead you embrace it. The next idea I want to explore is that this Thor, this god of thunder, is allowed to feel like a god. He isn't nerfed. More often than not, the narratives are written and the fight scenes are choreographed around this character in a way that never feels cheap, never feels like Thor's just another heavy hitter. I don't ever really talk about power levels or power scaling on this channel, even when discussing superhero media, because A, I'm more interested in the stories and themes than the fights, and B, I'm aware that 90% of any character's strength level depends on who's writing the fight. But I think it's worth pointing out that while Thor's role in this Avengers team, from an archetypal point of view, is the warrior, the big guy, he's very rarely taken out of the conflict in the contrived types of ways typical for characters in this role. In this show, the ways Thor gets defeated, or doesn't get defeated for that matter, nearly always consider his Asgardian nature. In the episode of the Masters of Evil, it takes an entire supervillain squad, including two other Asgardians, to even knock him out. And a whole bunch of times some supervillain or other has a gimmick which incapacitates the human Avengers, but Thor remains unaffected. See the Skrull failsafe in Season 2, or the way the Thunderer is unaffected by the leader's Gamma Dome. The one time he is nerfed, it's the whole plot of the episode. These stories don't just treat Thor as the muscle. Stories are written around his character, his nature, not merely the archetypal role he fills. It isn't just that Thor's a strong hero, so you need really strong villains to beat him. Throughout these stories, Earth's Mightiest Heroes never loses sight of who this character is, and that he should feel different and play a different role in the story to his mortal teammates. And if nothing else, that just makes for a more satisfying watch. You buy into this world more, the magic, the mythical settings, when the show you've been watching has taken care to ensure that it all feels consistent. And it does remain consistent, across two seasons and over 50 episodes. If nothing else, it's impressive that this show's writers managed to nail this characterization straight away, and pretty much stick to it throughout, especially given how much MCU Thor's changed since his introduction. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, mind you, and I think the main reason for this Thor's many changes is due to the specific challenges of the movie format. In fact, that would make for an interesting video topic sometime in the future. But for now, we're not talking about it. We're talking about what made this Thor so great and I hope you agree with the reasons we've briefly explored in this video. But can I tell you a secret? They're not my reasons. I mean, I wrote this video, I explored, developed, and contextualized the things we've been talking about, but the skeleton for this video, the core ideas which I wrote around, aren't from me. They're from a comment I got way back on one of the first few videos I made for this channel, back when I was just starting my long-running video series analyzing this show. A viewer wanted to help out with a Thor video, should I ever make one, and suggested these basic reasons. So when I was figuring out my video schedule for this month, I thought, hey, why not finally make that video. Because while I'm probably the guy who spent the most time making videos about this show on YouTube, I think this demonstrates that I'm far from the only person who understands it well enough, or is creative enough to do so. And that's why I felt making this video with the help of this old comment from Arthur Mingo was the perfect way to launch Earth's Mightiest Playlist. In a nutshell, when I learned that the folks behind the hashtag Save the Yostverse revival effort were planning another digital trend event in May to try and go trending, to try and get Marvel's attention, I thought the best way I could try and help out was to reach out to a bunch of other YouTubers, big and small, and put together a collaborative playlist of videos about this show, made by a whole bunch of people. All with the idea of getting as many viewers as possible to log into Twitter and tweet with the hashtag Save the Yostverse one week from the time this 
playlists going live, May 21st at 12pm UTC. So if you're watching this, please come and help out with the trend attempt. I'm no expert at Twitter analytics and I've no idea how well this video is going to do, but I'm guessing that even if, say, 1% of the people who see this video in the first week joined the movement and tweeted with us on May 21st, that may well be enough to get this hashtag trending. And in the meantime, you can check out the rest of Earth's Mightiest playlist, which should be linked on screen now, as well as at the end of the video and in the description and the pinned comment. I reached out to quite a few channels about this and I heard back from fewer than I'd have liked, but I'm relatively confident that there'll be some pretty fire content already in the playlist as this video launches or shortly thereafter. For instance, I believe Superframe is releasing a video on Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes to coincide with the playlist, though I don't know precisely when it's coming out. I also know that some of my regular viewers are making content for the playlist, so I'm really excited to check out the rest of it myself, and to see how it grows in the next few days. And if anyone watching now wants to try and put something together over the next week or so, a video essay, a theory video, a review, anything about Avengers EMH or the other related shows of the Yostverse, please do, send it my way and I'll put you in the playlist too. And to everyone else, thanks so much for watching. And make sure you check out this playlist, and to check back again in a couple of days as more and more content trickles in. Because more views means more tweets, which means a bigger chance we finally get a third season of Earth's Mightiest Heroes. So remember to tweet hashtag save the Yostverse in a week's time, and big thanks as always to my patrons on screen now, particularly Kevin Douglas and Ian Fifield.